Welcome to the podcast, Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path, and I'm your host, Mike Allen. You know, normally when you talk about draft dodging, you're talking about the would-be soldier trying to find a way to avoid military conscription. Well, in today's episode, we turn the tables a little bit and look at a Connecticut doctor, the one who was screening potential recruits as the source of the dodging. And for good measure, this all occurred during, believe it or not, the Civil War. Our guest is Peter Vermillier. He teaches history at Falls Village Regional High School in Litchfield County. He's the author of several books on Litchfield County. And today he's here to talk about that Civil War doctor, Litchfield's Dr. Josiah Beckwith. He's featured in Peter's new book, Litchfield County and the Civil War. This week's trivia question, former Connecticut State Police Commissioner John Kelly called this murder 100 years ago his most exciting case. Which town did it occur in? We'll stick around after the main program for the answer because then you'll know the topic for next week's show. Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path is brought to you by our sponsor, Yale New Haven Health. When people need the best quality health care, there's a reason they turn to Yale New Haven Health. In 1826, Yale New Haven Hospital became Connecticut's very first hospital. They were the first hospital in the U.S. to use chemotherapy. Yale New Haven was the first to introduce insulin pumps for diabetic patients. And they introduced the world's first intensive care unit for newborns. For more information about Yale New Haven Health, visit ynhhs.org. That's ynhhs.org. Trying to dodge the military draft is serious business. For starters, you can wind up in jail. Generally speaking, there are two reasons why a draft board might turn down a recruit. Number one, they're either religious ministers or conscientious objectors who are opposed to combat. The other one is they're not physically fit and they get a medical deferment. Well, over the years, the medical deferment system has been abused. I'm sure you've heard stories, as have I, about potential recruits who found a friendly doctor to certify that they had a health problem only to find out later it either wasn't so or it was greatly exaggerated. Well, today's story is about a Connecticut doctor who handed out deferments, it would seem on purpose, during the Civil War. The story takes place in Litchfield, the namesake for Litchfield County, of course, the year 1862. The Civil War had already been raging for a year and a half, and the focus is on an upstanding doctor in Litchfield, Dr. Josiah Beckwith. Now, his office was in his home, which was right next to the post office, and just 500 feet from the main Litchfield Green. That house, by the way, is still standing. Now, by the summer of 1862, President Abraham Lincoln realized he had a major fight on his hands against the southern states, and he needed to call up more Union troops. And so Lincoln put out the call for another 600,000 soldiers, and it came in two separate orders. The first order came in July of 1862. It was for 300,000 volunteers to serve three years. The second order came just a month later in August, again, for 300,000 inductees, but they were only needed for nine months. However, that August notice said that if enough volunteers didn't sign up, able-bodied men would be drafted. Well, our guest is author and historian Peter Vermillier, an expert on Litchfield County. In his new book, Litchfield County and the Civil War, he devotes an entire chapter to Dr. Beckwith. Peter, I have to say, I grew up in the age of the Vietnam War, and we knew what dodging the draft meant uh, then, people burning their draft cards, uh, actively trying to avoid what they thought was an unjust war. And when you compare that against the earlier generation of World War II, where you had you know, athletes and entertainers going you know, into Europe and wanting to join the fight, two completely different worlds. This is the first time that I've really heard of supposed draft dodgers in the Civil War. I've heard of the white flag peace movement. We'll get into that. But this is, this is amazing. So let, let's start off talking about this guy, Josiah Gale Beckwith. And of course, it's Dr. Beckwith. Who is he? Where'd he come from? Why is he even on the stage? Why are we talking about him? He's from upstate New York. College educated, goes off to, you know, he has a really good medical training. He comes to Litchfield. He marries up very prominently into the Seymour family in Litchfield. 
And he becomes a major player in a very short amount of time, appointed to statewide medical boards. He's a candidate for governor, you know, sort of of a minor party, but that's the kind of really quick recognition that he gets. He has a prominent medical practice. He's working as a physician. He's also running a pharmacy out of his house on South Street in Litchfield that still stands right near the post office. His son is appointed to the Naval Academy. In all ways, it appears that, as you said, this is an upstanding citizen. Now, the people, all sides, I mean, the soldiers who are marching to go fight and the people who ended up not being you know, signed up for duty all had to go see Dr. Beckwith or somebody, right, to get their physical? Not exactly, but close. Lincoln makes two calls for 300,000 men each in the summer, one in early July, the other in early August. The early July call is for 300,000 men to volunteer for three years. The other call in early August is for 300,000 men to serve for nine months. The other thing that's different besides the amount of time is that specific call and legislation allows for a draft if they don't fill their quotas. So prior to August, if you weren't medically capable of fighting the war, you just didn't enlist. You just didn't volunteer. There was no way to be forced into it. But now there's this draft on the scene. And so the state has to determine how to efficiently and accurately exempt men with medical conditions that would prevent them from joining the war. And so they provide that each county will have three medical examiners. So the Surgeon General of the state appoints these medical examiners. And there's one appointed in Washington, and there's one appointed in Winstead, and Beckwith is appointed at his office in Litchfield to be a medical examiner. So now with this second call for troops in August of 62, if you wish to avoid being drafted for medical reasons, you have to get a certificate from one of these three examiners. Now, you've done a lot of research on this time period, and you are a Litchfield County expert. What was the tenor of the feeling of the, you know, should we take it to the South in terms of a fight or should we negotiate this, uh, this civil war issue? And, you know, how was it in Litchfield County? How was it, how were the uh, politics shaping up? If the question was asked to me in my research, what surprised me the most? My answer would be, I was most surprised by the anti-war sentiment that I encountered and the way that those who supported the war took matters into their own hands to silence those critics. At the beginning of the war, you had these peace flags that show up, the white flags that were being flown on houses or being put in, in the yard saying that we want peace, we don't want this war. You have a few instances, including a really notable instance in Goshen. They say that they, they were Confederate flags. I suspect that they weren't the Confederate flag that we think of today, but they were rather secession banners, like pro-secession banners being flown in some places. And in Goshen, by several accounts, there's actually shots exchanged as a group of vigilantes go to take down that flag from a farm in Goshen. So there's a small but fairly vocal anti-war movement in Litchfield County. I think this all comes to a head in Morris, a really well-known anti-war activist named Elias Schnabel comes to Morris. And by this time, Lincoln has suspended the writ of habeas corpus and has, in essence, said, you know, if you go out and you speak against the war or you print anti-draft sentiments in your newspaper, you're going to jail. And this guy Schnabel comes to Morris and begins to give an anti-war talk and is arrested by federal marshals on the scene. So there is this small 
but present anti-war movement in Litchfield County. Interesting enough, Schnabel, I think, was the guy from Pennsylvania, and, and he was scheduled to appear a couple of places around Connecticut, and because he got arrested in Morris, he didn't make it to the other places to appear. No, he made it to Fort Lafayette, where he was held as a prisoner in New York City. <laughs> so let's go back to the issue at hand here with Dr. Beckwith. So at some point along the line, somebody puts two and two together and says, huh, it seems like he's giving out more of these exemptions to not fight than maybe he ought to be. How did we hear about this? At the time, while it's going on, you see in the newspapers, and I point out that there's three active newspapers in Litchfield County at the time. There was the Litchfield Inquirer, there was the Winstead Herald, and there was the short-lived Housatonic Republican in Falls Village, which was great for my purposes because it only existed for a few months, but it was at this exact time period. And all three of them talk about what's going on with Beckwith and these medical exemptions and the cowards who are turning out and the language is colorful. These men were seen yesterday, you know, strapping young men yesterday, carrying heavy weights on their way to work. And now today we see them limping into Litchfield. But they talk about the line from the earliest hours of the morning until midnight, the line of people wanting medical exams so they could get these certificates of exemption, the line stretched from Beckwith's house all the way on to the Litchfield Green. Beckwith kept pretty meticulous records about everybody that he examined. And what was really interesting to me in looking through all those, one is that there's an awfully good number of men coming from Winstead in Washington now, why would they be doing that if they had their own medical examiners? Why would you make that trip? The second thing is you see three guys in a row examined from Plymouth, and then maybe you see six guys in a row from New Milford, and then five guys from Canaan, for example. It shows that these men are traveling together to these exams. And then the other thing that really stands out is very, very few people have just one malady. It doesn't say rheumatism. It says rheumatism and fractured jaw and missing a finger and death. Very few people have just one condition that would exempt them. What's most striking is the percentages. We're talking over 90% of the men who come to see Beckwith walk away with a certificate of exemption. Wow. What about the other two doctors? Nobody accused them of this. No, nobody accused them. And in fact, the doctor in Winstead, he was written up in the paper with one accusation that was brought against him. And then the following week, there was a reply and a retraction. And, you know, we apologize for the misunderstanding, but nothing on this scale. So now you've gone and done all this research. It seems pretty clear the scales are tipped here. If you went into Beckwith, you were coming out with an exemption that you didn't have to go fight. What did your research show? Why was he doing this? And, and, and is it your opinion he was doing this? So I, I think this is the key question. If we could just talk for a second about the scale of this operation. We know there were people waiting outside as early as five in the morning and there until midnight. There's some illusion, I wouldn't go as far to say it's, to me it's proven, that he may have had an assistant helping him. But even if we do that, the numbers of people that show up for this medical exam, he would spend less than five minutes per person without a break if he worked from five in the morning until midnight. So it tells us a little bit about the thoroughness of these examinations. There's people who suggest that Beckwith was financially benefiting from this. I find, in essence, no evidence of that. He got a quarter per examination. He got a quarter whether the person got an exemption or not. There's no substantial change in his property records or his tax bill. But what I think tends to stick a little bit more are the political charges. Been charges is a little too strong. He wasn't 
charged criminally. But there's accusations that he supports this peace movement and he wants to sort of do his part to end the war by preventing manpower. We should point out that Beckwith is summoned to Hartford. There's like a five-day run in which he's doing these medical examinations. And in the middle of it, he is summoned to Hartford to appear before the Surgeon General and to answer these allegations that are brought against him. And he goes to Hartford, and he comes back, and he starts seeing men the next morning, and then he's shut down at about noon on the last day because his license as a medical examiner for the military has been revoked. Not his medical license, but his license to do examinations. All of those newspapers I mentioned are all Republican Party-leaning newspapers. The Litchfield Inquirer allows Beckwith the opportunity to make his case, to present his side of this controversy. At the end, he talks about George McClellan, who was the commander of the major Union army, who had just failed in his campaign to capture Richmond. And McClellan blames his failure on having too many sick soldiers with him. And he said, I would take fewer soldiers if, if they were all healthy and fight half the number of men, but none of the sick soldiers or something like that. We would have succeeded. This is where Beckwith hitches his star. He says, this is what I'm doing. I'm eliminating all of this excess that would burden our army. The problem is that at this exact same time, McClellan, that Union Army commander, is being set up as sort of the political foil to Lincoln. In fact, McClellan will run against Lincoln for the presidency in 1864. And McClellan is on the verge of a falling out with Lincoln. And when McClellan goes down, Beckwith is going to be tarnished with him. When I read this part of it, I thought to myself, you know, if you're going to give yourself a defense on something like this, that's a pretty good argument. If Beckwith had just said, I was operating within these broad categories, men who are not fit for the military. If he had just stuck to that argument, I think that a lot, a lot of this wouldn't have stuck. But he drifted too close to these dangerous political waters. He became tarnished as one of these peace men that what he was really looking to do was sabotage the Union war effort. What I think is interesting is in the summer of 1862, when the Civil War is going strong and they need men to go fight there's this sort of morality play that takes place right on the streets of Litchfield, where the heroes are these young men who are marching to the camp to volunteer. And the villain is, in some ways, the guy that nobody would have expected, Josiah Beckwith. Once the Beckwith saga was over and Beckwith had passed on, the Surgeon General issued much stricter and clearer regulations so the doctors would have a uniform set of rules for determining who should get a medical deferment and who should not. up this episode of Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path. You know, the camp where newly signed up recruits would do their training in Litchfield to go to the war was just a mile down the road from Beckwith's office, and that led to even more discussions, as you can imagine, about his practices through the summer of 1862. I want to thank our guest for today's program, Peter Vermillier. He's a history teacher at Falls Village Regional High School in Litchfield County and author of several books on Litchfield County, including his latest, Pick It Up, Litchfield County and the Civil War. The answer to this week's trivia question, the question was, former Connecticut State Police Commissioner John Kelly called this murder 100 years ago his most exciting case. Which town did it occur in? Well, the answer is Ridgefield. Next week on Amazing Tales CT, we're going to have the story of the murder of a 72-year-old farmhand by a 24-year-old farmhand after hours and not on the farm. It stumped many investigators, but not John Kelly. Wait until you hear how he unraveled it. Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path is a production of True North Associates, LLC. 
This is Mike Allen. Be safe and please stay healthy.